A young girl is praising a man. What should the father understand? Subhanallah. Subhanallah. You know, dad, mashallah, tabarakallah. Good man, really good man. He's honest, he's hardworking. The father says, okay, I've understood it. I've understood it. In our times, they're not as shy as that. They'll tell you, dad, I want to marry him. Straight. It's not, it's not as shy as that. Before, if you look at the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa also he speaks about how a woman sometimes says a few good words about a man, giving like signs to say, you know what, I'm interested. Dad, can you please find out? Question that we have. Is it wrong for a woman to show interest in marrying someone and to tell her folks, I'm interested in so-and-so, please find out more. Please, can you help me? Is it wrong? The answer is no, it is not wrong. As much as we do not condone a haram relationship, do not go out with someone and, you know, sleep with them and astaghfirullah, do, what, do whatever is haram there is to be done and then come to dad and say, dad, you know what? I've been going out for five years now. I think I'm ready to get married. That's not an Islamic way of doing things. From the beginning, you say, dad, you know what? I don't have a relationship, but I'd like you to find out more about this person. Subhanallah, because perhaps they are good. I came across them this way or that way or whatever way. Sometimes you stumble across them in a correct way. Sometimes it could have been perhaps maybe may not have started in such a brilliant way, but keep it as clean as possible. My brothers and sisters, remember when you sow a seed, let it be a pure seed so that a pure fruit can grow. Don't let it be a seed of evil. If you've done something wrong, make tawbah, it will purify the seed. People say, you know, when I got married, I did the wrong thing. When I got married or oh, before I got married, I did so much of wrong. My brothers and sisters, it's not the end of the world. You can change it by tawbah. Seek Allah's forgiveness and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. And you will definitely find the doors opening and the seeds purifying once again. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. But the point here is, look at how she raised the issue. The father understood it. Let's go back to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Khadija bin Khawailid radiallahu anha. Against all odds, against all odds, she also proposed for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She wouldn't have believed that it was going to be accepted. Guess what? It came through. And that was the best marriage he had. He had all his children from her. Khadija radiallahu anha. Subhanallah. He used to miss her later on. She was much older than him. So it's not wrong for a woman to show interest. In some cultures, it is taboo for the father of the girl to go out and to, to the father of the boy or even to the boy and say, you know what? My daughter is actually interested in marrying you or I would like you to marry my daughter, etc. Some cultures believe it's totally taboo. Remember, who knows that you have a daughter? Many people don't. You need to come out. You've seen all the sons in the masajid, haven't you? You've seen all the people all around. You know, you interact. Subhanallah. Nowadays, people tell their kids, find your own spouse. That's it. No, it's also your duty, your responsibility. Mainly, it is you. The hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speaks about how a person who has three daughters looks after them and gives them a decent upbringing and helps them getting married into decent homes and is kind to them will get Jannah. Do you know why? Because you brought up a child for somebody else. That's the reason. You brought up a daughter. You loved her. You spent on her. You invested and you did everything. And you gave her away to someone else. That's the most difficult thing you could ever do. You did it. Allah says, for you is Jannah. Someone asked the messenger, what about if I only had two daughters? He says, even two. Subhanallah. That's the reason. And this is why in Islam, we don't sell our kids with a dowry and a bride price to say, listen, I'm the father. I need $17,000. That's it. Why? Because I sent her to school. She went to a government school. She went to university. She did this. She did that. That's part of your Jannah. If you want the payment in the dunya, forget about that Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah grant us ease. With us, there is no dowry or bride price. There is only something known as a mahr, which is a gift from the groom to the bride. Subhanallah. Sometimes we call it a down payment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So it's amazing how the father says, Inni uridu an unkihaka ihda bnatayya hatayni ala an ta'jurani thamani ijaj. I would like to get you married off to one of my two daughters on condition that you work for me for eight years. MashaAllah, work for me for a while, meaning you marry her, stay with me.
That brings me to another cultural aspect of our living that people consider taboo. Man gets married, he lives with his in-laws. Everyone says, sell out, look at him. He can't even live, living off his father-in-law. They have names to refer to such people. Do you know that? Derogatory names. Yet, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in fact, Prophet Musa Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, he worked for his father-in-law. Anything wrong? No, not at all. He worked for him. How many years? Ten whole years, not just eight. He added another two. Subhanallah. He said, no problem, I work. Did anyone insult him? Not at all. The idea is they need to be happy, whether this side, that side, or independent. For as long as you're happy, respecting each other, and, and you are living with each other, you will save yourself from a lot of trouble and calamity and turmoil and turbulence. There is nothing to say you have to live here, or you have to live there, or you're not allowed to live with your in-laws, or you cannot take from your father-in-law. If he wants to give you, alhamdulillah, nurun ala nur, why not? Take it, alhamdulillah. The others are jealous brats. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. No, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. My brothers and sisters, I think the point is quite clear. To say in Islam, there's no hard and fast rule. To say you're not allowed to do this or you're allowed to do that. Generally, you're the man. So much so that Musa alayhi salam did not have any provision. He did not have much. He only had strength and what else? Honesty. Two qualities. And the daughter of a Nabi was given to him. Take. Subhanallah. And he was a strange man. He was not yet a Nabi of Allah. He was a stranger, but they found him to be a good man within no time. Subhanallah. How many of us would do that? Subhanallah. Well, I know someone might say, well, look, if it was Musa alayhi salam, I probably would have. <laughs> but my brothers and sisters, the point being raised is when you have a son-in-law who's respectable, responsible, hardworking and honest, even if he is poor, even if he doesn't yet have money, no problem. He will look after your daughter the way he will look after himself. So you get him married because many of us today who have children, mashallah, and perhaps we are living a little bit wealthier than what we were before. We started off with zero. We, when we married for 20 years, we did not even have a car or a house next to our name. And we are demanding that he who comes to marry our daughter must already have two palaces. Subhanallah. We demand that he must already have such a salary. He must have a car. He must have this. He must have that. Where did we get this from? Save yourselves the tension. We are promoting promiscuity and adultery by making that which is halal difficult. If you make nikah difficult, wallahi, you will be answerable in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having made zina and adultery so easy. Because Allah made nikah and marriage simple in order to avoid haram. And we are making it difficult so that people fall into haram. You definitely share a portion of the sin if you are guilty. May Allah make it easy for us. My brothers and sisters in Islam, when I practice a particular action, did I do it because of tradition first or because of Islam first? I know customs and traditions are important in Islam, very important. In fact, in our Sharia, ah, there are five principles in coming to a conclusive uh, ruling in fiqh, and one of these principles is al. That customs can be used in a court of law. Customs can be used in making rulings in Sharia. But not before a clear, a clear ruling from Allah or His Messenger is there. So when there are clear rulings from Allah and His Messenger, and there is tradition and custom, which one do I put before the other? I'll give you a few examples. As a marriage celebrant, I'm a marriage celebrant in Australia, I found out many different cultures in how they perform their marriages. And subhanAllah, some of them were pleasing, but others of them, wallahi, caused us so much heartache, heartache, which caused a lot of youth to not want to get married and resort to haram means or to difficult means, which caused the parents to fall into predicaments. Tradition and culture, for example, in my culture, the Arab culture, so that I don't attack anyone here of a different culture, subhanAllah. In my culture, the Arab culture, the Lebanese culture, when you want to get married, you have to talk about the mahar. This is Islamic. The mahar, the dowry, as loosely translated. 
And it is a custom and tradition in certain parts of Lebanon that it has to be more than a hundred thousand dollars. Mahar of a hundred thousand to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And you know what they say to you? They say to you, don't worry, don't worry, it's just ink on paper. You know what ink on paper means? Habar ala warak. Meaning it's, it's, we're not, we don't really mean it. Allahu Akbar. And then you reply and you know that on the day of judgment, Allah will ask you about this mahab. Because Allah says, nihla. Give your wives the sadaq. The sadaq is the mahar which you promised them. Nihla. From, you know, out of satisfaction, out of clear heartedness. And don't take any of it. You come and tell them this, they say, no, 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 it's just ink on paper. And then, the, God forbid, when a divorce happens or a separation happens, what happens? The parents come in and they say, we want every cent. What happens to this person? Culture takes over and this person no longer wants to get married. How can they get married and afford to get married? So what do they resort to? Their daughters, their sons, eloping, running off. Why make the mahar so big? Because of culture and the stresses of tradition. What will people think? My daughter went cheap. Allah, Allah. So now you're selling your daughter? One brother said to me, uh, he went to Lebanon to get married. Malish, I can speak about my own kind a little bit. <laughs> went to get married. Brother said to him, $50,000, knowing that he's from Australia. He said, You're selling me a, a cattle, a cow or something? <laughs> What's this? <laughs> this is a trade of livestock? <laughs> your daughter is worth more than that. But do you have to put a price to her? This tradition. Another thing, when you get engaged, you have to chuck this huge party. You know, engagement, engagement, before marriage, the nikah hasn't even been done. So then they say, okay, now I want to officially engage you to my daughter. We have to invite the relatives and we have to invite this person and that person and that person. So how much money are you going to spend on this celebration? You have to hire this hall out and you have to buy this thing. And she has to wear a semi-wedding dress. Allahu Akbar. The brother is not even halfway, he's not even married, it's just a question. Can I marry your daughter inshallah in the future and see how things go? And automatically he's already paid what the amount of what it will cost to actually get married. So the brother ends up poor and then says, Subhanallah, you know, look, uh, we can't get married right now. Tayyib, why? I've spent all my money on your engagement. We have to now postpone it till about a year. I have to work harder and I have to now work double jobs. I'm sorry I can't talk to you. I can't get to know you anymore because this was the intention. Because now I have to go to work. Night shift and day shift. Then the parent says, Ya akhi, it's been one year. You know, tradition says that you're not allowed to be with her alone. Let's do the katb tab, the nikah contract. So they come to do the katb tab. Ah! But when you do the katb tab, you are not allowed to go out alone. You're not allowed to hold each other's hands. What will people think? Okay, Akhi, you've married her. No, 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 no. We're only doing this to help you because people will start talking, you're coming in and out, in and out all the time. This is Aib. So now look how difficult marriage has become. And then they want to cut off the marriage. Bring the mahar. I thought it was ink on paper. Every cent. She's my daughter. You think she'll go cheap like that? Just come and go? So what happens? They don't want to get married anymore. We have now in the West this idea of de facto relationships and partnership. No longer husband and wife. Even in our own Muslim community. Why? Because they prioritize tradition and culture and customs more than Islam itself. But what I was trying to point out was when culture and tradition become so serious that subhanAllah simplicity of the deen turns into this complication. I've just given one simple example of culture and customs and tradition where the deen made it so easy and when we prioritize things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make upon us we become like the people before us as the Christians and Jews did they made rabbi, you know, rabbis and, and, and uh, priesthood where a sect of them are not allowed to get married priests who cannot get married we see the result today of what is happening to them how can an Imam give counseling to a married couple when he cannot get married? How? So, when we make, prioritize certain things before Allah and His Messenger, our hearts become hardened. Our relationships become severed. Our happiness goes away. Our lives become complicated. 
and all of our actions which we did are like dust in the wind. I wish that we could have even earned something pleasurable out of it. 